Weather Channel, a special presentation. It's been called Tornado Alley, a track to cross America's heartland that spawns more tornadoes than anywhere else on Earth. What are the natural forces that cause nature's most fearsome storm? Who are the new breed of scientists who study tornadoes up close? How can we protect ourselves, our homes, our children from the enemy wind? For a thousand years before the white man arrived, the Kansa Indians inhabited these plains. They honored the bison, which fed them, provided them clothing and shelter, and they held a deep respect for the wind. The word Kansa means people of the wind, according to historians, and it is from this word that the state of Kansas takes its name. But the prairie is vastly different today from the time when the Kansa made their home here. The Kansa Indians would scarcely recognize their ancestral land today, with its bustling cities, its traffic, its crowded malls. But some things never change. The Indians of old would know their ancient homeland by its wind. It sounded like a freight train. It just passed right on top of us. Packing winds up to 300 miles per hour, it can dip out of the sky to almost capriciously destroy one home by leaving its neighbor untouched or it can cut a gash a mile wide, turning all it contacts into matchsticks. It can stay on the ground for moments or for several hours, sit in one place, or barrel along like a runaway train. Watch back to Greg's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. You gotta really go. They usually come alone. Sometimes they seem to like company, in thick versions, thin versions, even preposterously long serpentine versions. Tornadoes are not unique to the plains. Indeed, they occur in all 50 states, but they happen here more than anywhere else on Earth. Tornado Alley, cutting through the heartland of America, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, and extending as far north as Indiana, what are the unique factors here that make conditions perfect for nature's most fearsome storm? Well, of course, one of the things we look for is warm, moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. If you can combine that with cooler and drier air coming in from the north and west, well, add those ingredients to a little bit of daytime heating and wind shear, things may really start brewing. When warm, moist Gulf air meets cool Canadian air, the warm air rises. Clouds form. Storms develop. Wind shear. Winds at different altitudes blowing in different directions causes the air between the layers to begin spinning almost like a horizontal tornado, although not nearly as fast. When this horizontally rotating air meets an updraft, the rotating tube can become stretched, tilted. As the now nearly vertical tube tightens its spin, it speeds up. And the result... Here at the National Weather Service office in Norman, Oklahoma, meteorologists use the latest tools, some still experimental, tracking the severe storms that spawn tornadoes. Probably our most important function is the issuance of warnings for severe thunderstorms, flash floods, and tornadoes. We have a large number of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes each year, and it's very important that we are able to give the public some lead time so they can take some sort of precaution. On April 26, 1991, the people of Andover, Kansas, at the northern range of this advanced Doppler radar, would need all the lead time they could get. This is a time sequence of the traditional reflectivity display on April 26th of 1991, the day of a very large tornado outbreak in the Central Plain, primarily across relatively unpopulated areas in north-central Oklahoma. 
That same day, however, we had a series of tornadoes uh, just across the border in south central Kansas, and there were a number of fatalities. And now it's showing the signs of the, the characteristic hook echo. The hook echo, a typical pattern that means rain is wrapping itself around a spinning core. And that rotation means one thing. Oh, God. It's gonna miss it. But it ain't gonna miss part of this area. As the storm system moved to the north and east across the plains, it spawned more than 50 tornadoes. The most deadly struck the small town of Andover, Kansas. Oh my God, it's gonna hit us! It's coming right towards our house. We had two officers that had sighted the tornado already, and we had the siren had failed. Sergeant Paul C. took this video from his patrol car as he drove through the Golden Spur trailer park in Andover. Here we can clearly see the approaching tornado, now a monstrous storm with winds exceeding 250 miles per hour. And it appears some residents are unaware or unmindful of the imminent danger. All those who would die in Andover that day would be residents who did not or could not get to a shelter in time. I was in the living room, in fact, uh, sitting in the living room watching TV and had enough time to get up, turn off the TV, shut the doors to the TV cabinet, and go to the basement. My son had called and said, Mom, get to the basement, and that was the last I talked to him until we found telephones that were working. Karen, let's hand over. Let's right now. Just hit the chief out. Let's go right through that. Let's go right through that mobile home park. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. When I came out of the basement, my first thought was, my God, they're all dead. I could not believe that anyone could live through what I was seeing. It looked like a bomb had gone off. It was unrecognizable if, if a person wasn't familiar with the town. If you didn't know how the streets were laid out, you'd never recognize it. The first priority was accounting for your neighbors. <laughs> and making sure that, oh, they're not home yet, and we know that they'll be home later. Or, oh my gosh, they may be in the house, and we need to get in there and see if we can find them. people died in Andover that day. In all, 19 died across Kansas. Dozens more were injured. Hundreds were left homeless, with damage estimates reaching into the tens of millions. Today, the small Kansas town still bears the scar of that awful afternoon. Its survivors will bear their memories for a lifetime. And along with the memories, is a shared desire to understand why did this happen? How could it happen? And how can we make ourselves safer the next time it happens? Now, your local forecast, accurate and dependable from the Weather Channel.
natural bent. Some take their research outdoors, watching the sky as clouds build into thunderheads. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, they create the outdoors on a computer. We are using numerical simulation models which allow us to simulate the structure of these storms uh, and compare it to observations to understand first whether the model is capable of uh, representing the, the real world and then to try to analyze in detail how these storms work and what motivates their evolution. This animation produced by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications is based in part on the work of Joseph Klemp and Richard Rotuno. They use measurements taken during severe storms, wind speed and direction, temperature, pressure, tens of thousands of measurements to create a computer simulation of a storm, a sort of what-if game wherein man controls all vital elements. The animation vividly illustrates the airflow into and through a developing thunderstorm. The red particles represent rising air. The blue represent falling air. Computer simulations allow researchers to experiment with different directions of wind flow, different temperatures, and more to study the effect each of these factors has on the development of a storm. Here, the arrows represent the rate of rotation in the winds as they progress through the storm. Note the increase in rotation as the winds enter an updraft or a downdraft. Updrafts and downdrafts are vital elements in the development of the storm's rotation. I think in the future, the research question is, can you actually take data from, say, a Doppler radar and put it into a computer model such as ours and then run a forecast to see whether or not, say, thunderstorm A will develop and become a tornadic thunderstorm or not. The limitation is obviously that we may or may not be simulating uh, things that correspond to the real world. That's the advantage of doing work in the laboratory. At Purdue University, Dr. John Snow deals with real winds, real measurements, real funnels, but on a really small scale. We have a device, which we call a tornado vortex chamber, that replicates in small scale many of the features of the lower one-third of a thunderstorm. And by controlling the conditions in that chamber, we're able to develop a small-scale spinning column of air that has many of the same properties as tornadoes in nature. We're able to control things like the air flow, the geometry of the flow, the amount of spin that we put into the air. So all the basic factors that control tornadoes, we have some degree of control here in the laboratory. Dr. Snow has discovered that unlike the superfast, high-altitude jet stream winds, the winds of a tornado are most concentrated very close to the ground, where there is more damage to be done in a donut-shaped ring. Much like a hurricane, tornadoes have what could be called an eye, within which the winds are almost calm. Actual figures on wind speeds are impossible to come by. No anemometer has ever survived inside of island tornado. Researchers estimate the speed by the degree of damage the tornado caused. Based on damage estimates, the Fujita scale rates tornadoes from F0, with speeds less than 72 miles per hour, to F5, packing winds over 260, perhaps as high as 300 miles per hour. The basic part of our research here is to understand how tornadoes produce the very high winds that they do and where those winds are concentrated within the tornado. That in turn can be used to not only to check numerical models, but also to be given to people like civil engineers who are interested in designing tornado-resistant or tornado-proof buildings. Here in the lab, we can reproduce the same vortex, so we can do experiments over and over again. In the field, you get one shot. The tornado comes by, you take your data, and that's what nature gave you. They just issued a tornado warning for right where we are. But this researcher's approach, in true Western spirit, might seem suited to busting broncos. You learn a lot from the laboratory models and the computer simulations, but you still don't know what's really happening in nature. To know what's happening in nature, uh, you have to go out and make real measurements. We 
try to situate ourselves so that we're roughly two miles, maybe as close as one mile, away from the region where the tornado might be. That's usually off to the southeast of the storm. First thing we do is look for the wall cloud. Very nice wall cloud, and the whole thing is rotating. One of the discoveries made by the trackers is that the wall cloud is one of the first indications that a tornado may be forming. A wall cloud is a lowered cloud base. So when you see a wall cloud, it's evidence that you have a very strong updraft region and it's right next to a downdraft region. And that's an area where you expect to find tornadoes. A rapid rotation in the wall cloud and a funnel cloud is just to our north, northwest. We're packing up the radar and we're gonna move north. They've also learned the tornado usually forms on the rain-free southwest edge of the storm. Very often, the tornado will form simultaneously with the appearance of what we call a rear flank downdraft. We begin to see a clear spot, a clear area, begin on the western side of the wall cloud. When this rear flank downdraft wraps up around the wall cloud, we frequently will see the beginning of a tornado. That thing is starting to form a nice funnel. Actually, hold it, hold it, hold it. Can you turn it on? It is starting to form a funnel, and it's not that far away. What we have been doing over the last three or four years is use a portable Doppler radar to make measurements of the wind speeds within the tornado. We've been attempting to map the wind field of the tornado itself. Go a little bit to the left of the funnel. FMCW. FMCW. Oh, what a classic. But for all the information gained by these ventures, it's hard to tell what provides the greater motivation the desire to learn, or the sheer adrenaline rush of the chase. I'll give it, a, I'll give it an 8. An 8? An 8, 8.5. It was very close and very intense. Call the Weather Channel Connection, 1-900-WEATHER. For just 95 cents a minute, you can connect and get the weather for over 900 cities worldwide. Gardeners, if you love fresh-tasting vegetables and big, beautiful flowers, but think results like this take too much time and too much back-breaking work, here's great news. Introducing the affordable Troy Built Junior, designed especially for smaller gardens. Just look at the time and work the Junior will save you. It's so easy to prepare perfect, ready-to-plant seed beds. Plus, working organic matter into your soil is a snap. Spot till areas for beautiful flower gardens and borders. Why, you can even use the junior to reseed your lawn or ring fruit trees. You'll be amazed at how much time and work the junior will save you. So if you want to learn more about getting results like this, the fast, easy Troy Built way, call now to receive your free Troy Built catalog. For your free catalog featuring the Junior and our whole line of Troy Built Tillers, including our No Money Down Easy Payment Plan, call toll-free 1-800-441-3434. Operators are standing by. That's 1-800-441-3434. Call now. If you're about to travel, watch the five-day business planner here on the Weather Channel at 20 minutes after every hour. You get a comprehensive national report that covers the forecast over the next five days. Watch the five-day business planner coming up soon on the Weather Channel. Now, your local forecast, accurate and dependable from the Weather Channel. Common sense dictates a dual approach to tornado safety. First, we must learn to predict tornadoes more accurately, spot them sooner, and provide more time to take cover. 
and second, since our forecasts will never be perfect, we must learn to protect ourselves better when they strike, build better, safer structures. At the National Weather Service state-of-the-art facility in Norman, Oklahoma, researchers are using tomorrow's technology to prevent today's tragedies. The Norman office has a couple of things that I think are unique. One is its location across the street from a major research laboratory, the National Severe Storms Laboratory. Also the fact that we have a lot of technology in our office that is uh, being tested before it's implemented nationwide gives us uh, the advantage of dealing with new types of equipment and, and putting it to work uh, as a forecast tool at, at an earlier time. One of the newest and most useful tools for predicting tornadoes is the advanced Doppler radar, not yet available to most TV stations. The Doppler radar is a very advanced computer-controlled radar that, in addition to looking at storms as we have seen them in the past in terms of rainfall intensity, can also measure the winds blowing either toward or away from the radar. And that allows us to look at the storm and evaluate its potential to produce, say, tornadoes, uh, large hail, damaging straight-line winds. This is the wind toward and away from the radar. The greens are wind toward the radar. The reds are winds blowing away from the radar. Uh, but we can see with the Doppler that circulation descending and strengthening at the same time and then issue the warning before we have any visual clue that the tornado is actually forming. Doppler radar units such as the one in Norman are active now in Sterling, Virginia and Melbourne, Florida as well. They'll be deployed throughout the U.S. over the next few years. And along with an improved ability to predict tornadoes comes an increased warning capability. There are some new features that are available in these workstations that allow the forecasters to very quickly get out warnings. I could use one of these small little clear air returns to simulate a thunderstorm for the purposes of demonstration here. So now I'm going to put out a warning for that storm by turning on the warning generation software. With just a few simple keystrokes, the threatened area is identified, the warning box drawn, and the warning issued in less than a minute, half the time it once took. I just hit a return and that message goes automatically out on all of our media outlets and immediately the local television and radio and national agencies will get those messages and be able to act on them. As soon as that warning is put out by the local weather service office, we receive it almost immediately here at the Weather Channel and literally at the same time we receive it, it is sent back out to the destination where it is supposed to go and if your county is in the warned area, you will instantly see a red screen for a warning on your TV set. Despite advances in our ability to predict tornadoes and provide warnings, the storms themselves are still inevitable. And when they strike... Clear, three, two, one, fire. We can only hope we are prepared and protected. Flying debris is probably the most dangerous thing about the tornado. And it not only does a lot of damage to physical property, but it's very dangerous to individuals if you're caught out in the open. In a basement laboratory at the Institute for Disaster Research in Lubbock, Texas, Dr. James McDonald uses a 20-foot cannon to simulate the effect of tornadic winds. The air-powered cannon shoots a 12-foot 2x4 at speeds up to 150 miles per hour. What we're looking at here primarily is uh, the resistance of different types of building materials to the impact of these missiles. And this, of course, is very important in, in designing and trying to protect structures from the effects of the winds. Reinforced concrete is the best material, but it's not always practical to use that in some applications, so that's why we're looking at some of the weaker materials as well. The worst material, just plain old wood siding and sheetrock and things like that that you find in an ordinary timber constructed house or a mobile home. In the future, it, it may allow us to develop uh, new types of uh, wall systems, for example, that would uh, be able to absorb the energy of the missile more efficiently than what we're using today. But conducting a controlled experiment in a laboratory, even one in which boards hit brick at 150 miles per hour, is an experience far different from living through a tornado, as Tolly Hartman did. The tornado that struck Andover was an F5, with winds estimated at 300 miles per hour. I took pictures of the, uh, the house and the neighborhood right after the storm and put them together in a scrapbook. This is a picture of the garage after the tornado. Pushed the back wall down on top of the cars that were in the garage. 
The garage door went off to nobody knows where. We never found any part of the garage door. A steel-clad front door with a, a push-on hubcap from a, like a utility trailer that penetrated the steel coating on that door just like a bullet would have. These are pictures of the kitchen on the east side of the house after the storm had passed through. The old regulator clock on the wall stopped as the tornado went through the house. A piece of fence going through the wall. You don't have enough composure about you to take as many as you should have. I have one that I think is really neat. It's a picture of the moonrise that night. And it was just as clear and pretty like nothing had happened. Except there weren't any houses left. One year later, the rebuilding of Andover, Kansas is almost complete. Polly Hartman was one of the lucky ones. Thirteen died in Andover that day, all of whom could not or did not find shelter in time. A tragedy anywhere, but one of monstrous proportions in a small town such as this. Advances in tornado prediction have made life on the plains safer. Still, we can never be assured the tragedy that struck Andover will not happen again. And if it comes again, it may come just as swiftly and just as brutally. So perhaps the most valuable lesson is one the Kansas Indians learned a thousand years ago. We must grant the wind its due respect.